ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And um, firstly, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk tonight at, the, uh, at this Common Knowledge Edinburgh event. Um, as Richard said, my name is Simon Milne. Um, I was introduced to Richard, um, I think back in May, by a lady who some of you might have heard of, uh, Dr. Claire Craig, who is uh, the, um, she's a pathologist and she's also the co-founder of Heart and uh, the author of a, a book uh, about the, the whole pandemic. Um, so I'd met, I'd met Claire um, early in the year, actually at an event in London, uh, which was organized by Together. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Together, the Together Declaration. And, oh, it seems like everyone knows about Together. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, and, and as Richard said, I was, uh, I've been following Together and Alan Miller for quite some time. And um, they asked me to join them on the panel at uh, an event they were sponsoring in Edinburgh back in July, uh, which was opposing uh, LTNs and LEZs. Um, some of you might have been there. I think Richard was. Um, oh, some more. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, that uh, I, I am, as Richard said, I'm just an ordinary businessman. Um, I wasn't particularly involved with or interested in. Well, I would say I've always been reasonably interested in politics, but uh, the uh, uh, really the, the, the whole lockdown thing pretty much closed my business for a while. And um, I, I started to listen to what was being told to me. And um, I had a problem with quite a lot of that, actually. Um, so I, uh, I decided to get a Twitter account and started tweeting, uh, which I'd never done before. Uh, I'm not even sure you can call it tweeting anymore, because it's, it's now X. I'm not sure if you X somebody or X something. Yeah, it looks like a whole load of kisses. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I, I got involved with Twitter, uh, started to get some followers, um, met some people uh, who introduced me to more people, and, uh, and I'm here tonight. Um, so what I decided to do was, uh, Richard has suggested that I spoke for 40 minutes, um, and I just don't think I can hold everyone's attention for 40 minutes, so... <laughs> so what, I, what, I, what I've decided to do is I've, I've done a, a monologue, which is a lot shorter. It's probably about 15 minutes. So, uh, and that pretty much covers my views on uh, the, uh, or summarizes my views on the world at the moment. Um, and then I think we should just get straight into a Q&A session and hopefully get a bit of a conversation going with everyone in the room. Um, before I get started, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself, although I think Richard's actually told you uh, as much as I was going to say. But uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I'm from Dundee. Somebody has to be, I guess. Um, but I was actually brought up in, uh, in East Africa, in Kenya, East Africa, uh, where I went to school until I was uh, about 13. Uh, and then I ended up at boarding school uh, here in Edinburgh, actually, not so far away, just outside a little village called Collington. There's a school called uh, Murkison Castle, um, which is a little bit like Hogwarts, but without the central heating. Um, I liked it so much that I only spent two terms <laughs> and, then, and then left. Uh, but I ended up at a, uh, another boarding school that was slightly better, I would say, uh, outside Perth called Strathallan which I stayed, finished my A-levels, and went on to uh, university in Dundee. Uh, well, I say university, uh, to be fair, it was actually commonly known as the Bell Street Tech when I went there, but it did actually, after graduation, it got elevated to university and is now called uh, Abate or University of Abate, a, a very fine establishment it, it is. Um, so whilst I was at university, my parents, um, uh, in fact, my, my father's just sitting behind there. Just, just, hi, Dad. Um, so uh, my, 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 my father was working out in West Africa at the time in a country called Cameroon. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get 
a job as part of my sandwich degree working for a company called Texaco Oil that was very exciting and uh, a great experience for me. I came back, finished my degree, um, ended up joining a company in Dundee that made wooden doors. And uh, several years later, I bought that company, uh, ran it for a few years, got bored, sold it, um, set up another business in the Middle East in the building industry as well. Um, I've sold that now, but I'm still involved in that industry. So I've kind of got one foot in Scotland and one foot in the Middle East. Um, so, and, and yes, the, the, the politics, the, the political thing really just, just as I said earlier, just, just came about from uh, being in lockdown and just being really concerned and ultimately quite disillusioned with our government, uh, which is what brought me into social media and, as I said, has brought me here tonight. So what, as I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I've, I've prepared a, a, a monologue, it shouldn't be too long, um, but I'm going to go into that now. And then I think what we do is just go straight into a QA and a if everyone's up for that. So I'd just like to start actually with a quote by Nikola Tesla, which pretty much sums up what I think of mankind. We are all one. Only egos, beliefs, and fears separate us. So March 2020 was the first time in my lifetime, and I suspect in a lot of people's lifetimes, when our basic liberties were removed from us by our governments. Looking back, I'm still surprised by how easily we relinquished them. I think this demonstrates firstly how much trust many people had in their governments, and secondly, how effective fear can be used to control people. To begin with, I certainly fell for it. I was neither suspicious of our government nor our mainstream media. And I do believe that both were caught unawares and were caught up in the panic and the fear of the unknown. Which does beg the question, if COVID had been the killer virus that it was first portrayed, would the government's actions have been appropriate. As it turned out, COVID wasn't as deadly as it was portrayed. Unfortunately, due, I think, to a combination of greed, incompetence, as well as the human condition, those in power soon realized that there was money to be made and power to be abused. What followed was possibly the worst misgovernance this country has ever seen. An estimated 11.7 billion pounds was spent on purchasing and deploying COVID vaccines. 12 billion pounds on PPE, which by the way, the government now has admitted that it lost 75% due to inflated prices and kit that did not meet requirements. 37 billion pounds on track and trace system that according to the chair of the Public Accounts Committee made no measurable difference to the progress of the pandemic. Half a billion pounds on four Nightingale hospitals that, whose bed capacity was mostly unused throughout the pandemic. 70 billion pounds on furlough. That's a total of over 130 billion pounds, pushing our national debt to over 2.5 trillion pounds, which is over 100% of our GDP. Just to give you some perspective, it was under 30% in the year 2000. Of course, these are just direct financial costs. We would also, or should also consider the opportunity costs of closing down large parts of our economy. And then there is the social costs, which are arguably far more damaging and impossible to quantify. And whilst we were all locked down in our homes, it transpires that many government ministers were carrying on as normal largely ignoring the rules they'd forced on us. What was significant wasn't so much that they broke these rules, it was that they didn't care. Because by this time, they knew that the risks had been terribly inflated. They just didn't bother to tell us. Why? I think it was simply because they had recognized that COVID was a political gift that just kept giving. Of course, nothing lasts forever. So by late 2021, 
we experience the start of a cost of living crisis. Not surprising really, bearing in mind the government's spending spree over the previous two years. And in February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine, causing further distraction from the government mismanagement and sending gas prices rocketing, further exacerbating the UK's economic crisis. Now, whilst many will blame Putin's invasion for high gas prices, the fact is that the UK, and indeed much of Western Europe, has failed to invest in energy security, relying instead on imported gas, whilst, in, whilst close, closing our remaining coal-fired power stations and having abandoned building any new nuclear power stations over 25 years ago. Whilst the Western world hurries towards net zero in its attempt to save the world, two of the world's biggest economies, China and India, are still building coal-fired power stations. In fact, China are currently building, on average, two new coal-fired power stations every week. The UK is currently investing heavily into renewable energy, but that is unlikely to meet the country's needs for many years if indeed ever, which means we are likely to have high and volatile energy prices for a long time to come. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to argue about the causes of climate change, other than to say that if there is one thing that I have learnt over the last three and a half years, it is to question the gov anything that the government tells you that is going to have a serious impact on your life. I don't know if man's activities are causing global warming, but what I do know is that our current drive to net zero is going to reduce the standard of living of a lot of people. In the meantime, the war in Ukraine has so far cost the UK taxpayer almost five billion pounds. And it's also claimed over half a million casualties. Half a million. And what has it achieved? Well, one U.S. government official recently boasted that this war has enabled the USA to update its military hardware and weaken one of its enemies without losing a single American life. I just wonder how all the bereaved families would feel about that. Of course, the optics of this war have changed significantly over the last few weeks as a new theater of war has opened in the Middle East following Hamas's terror attack in Israel on the 7th of October. I find it interesting how easily we are distracted by the media. Perhaps controlled is a more appropriate word. All of a sudden, the war in Ukraine is yesterday's news. Something we were all so concerned about is over. Not because the war has ended, it hasn't. Because the media has decided that we need to focus on something else. Is this simply down to an irresponsible fickleness of the media? Or is there something more nefarious going on? Now, we've heard a lot about misinformation and disinformation. But we often discover that those trying to police this are the very people who are in fact generating it. It's called propaganda. They say truth is the first casualty of war well, certainly propaganda has been long recognized by governments all around the world as one of the most effective weapons of war. One of the biggest problems that we now have as a society is knowing what to believe and what not to believe. I was actually watching an old debate on YouTube the other day between Peter Hitchens and Christopher Hitchens on the Gulf War, where Peter Hitchens was going on about the lies we were all told about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. And he concluded that there is nothing more terrifying than someone who thinks he is right. I think we have to be very careful what we believe today and try to always keep in mind that all may not be as it first seems. Perhaps I'm only optimistically speculating but technology in the way of AI may one day overcomes, overcome man's propensity to lie. 
One of the most effective ways to rule over people is to keep them divided. Looking back over the last few years, there are so many examples of this. The rollout of the COVID vaccines proved very divisive. The climate emergency is similarly divisive, as has been the war in Ukraine. But this latest war in the Middle East has, in my opinion, caused more division than I've seen for quite a while. There has been, understandably, a very emotional response around the world to Hamas's terror attack. I think it's fair to say that most people, regardless of nationality, color, or religion, were horrified by what Hamas did. However, people have become divided over Israel's response. Its supporters refer to Israel's right to defend itself. But as the civilian deaths, including now thousands of young children, begin to rack up, the Muslim world in particular, as well as some Christian and Jew, Jewish people around the world, are becoming outraged by what Israel and its supporters are referring to as collateral damage in their war to destroy Hamas. There is, of course, a possibility of this war escalating beyond Gaza. Lebanon's Hezbollah has been intensifying its attacks on Israel from the north. And whilst Israel is heavily supported by the USA, Hezbollah receives huge support from Iran and, to some extent, from Russia. Here in the UK, the war in Gaza has already seen its first casualty with Suella Braverman being fired from her post as Home Secretary following comments that she made about the policing of pro-Palestinian marches. Whilst the war in Gaza is happening thousands of miles away, we are seeing demonstrations calling for an immediate ceasefire that are attracting a lot of media attention. I'm disturbed by the apparent increase in anti-Semitism, in Islamophobia, racism, nationalism, and general intolerance in our country, and I suspect this may not all be organic. Might it be that it is being stoked to create division ahead of the next general election? In any event, I think British society today not only feels edgy and restless, I think it feels like years of political frustration and division are now coming to a head. It's difficult to know what to make of the world right now. Personally, I think the post-war generations in the West have enjoyed an unprecedented standard of living and quality of life as the end of the war ushered in a fairer and more democratic society, which was augmented by the United States becoming the de facto leader of the Western world. But there is a saying that hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Looking around our country today, I can't help but wonder if the good times are maybe coming to an end. One thing is for sure, the world's power is shifting from west to east. The famous quote, which is often but probably wrongly attributed to Napoleon, that China is a sleeping giant, and when she wakes, she will shake the world, has come true. Ironically, it is the West that has fed this giant over the last 30 years or so. Walk into any shop and you will find that most goods now originate in the PRC. In fact, go into somewhere like B&Q, for example, and you will struggle to find any tool or component that is not made in China. Throughout history, never has a country that has achieved economic greatness not then gone on to become a military superpower. And China appears to be intent on becoming just that. The BRICS countries, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have already overtaken the G7 in share of the world GDP. And this trend can be expected to continue as a total of six countries are scheduled to join BRICS on the 1st of January. Argentina, although that is now in doubt because is opposed by a main opposition presidential candidate, but there's Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. We in the West have been very used to thinking of ourselves as the developed world, but things have changed and are continuing to change fast 
And we may, I think, in the coming years have to get used to being in what I would describe as the undeveloping world. So what does the future hold for the UK in general and in particular for Scotland? Well, as I've already said, I think we are going to have to get used to not being a major player on the world stage. This has been the case for a while, and certainly Britain's days of empire are well and truly over. However, I think the country has in some ways struggled in finding out what it now is, its place in the world, and opportunities for what it could become. I think Britain has struggled to let go of its past and concentrate on its future. In a referendum in 2016, the majority of voters in the UK chose to leave the European Union. I was actually a marginal remainer, whilst my wife was a marginal leaver. So neither of us voted. Again, Brexit was, and still is, a very divisive event in the country. And I have to say, I'm still torn on the subject. On the one hand, I see the opportunity of being part of a massive trading bloc, which has a combined GDP that's not much smaller than China's. But, on the other hand, I see a highly technocratic bureaucracy that behaved, in my opinion, quite undemocratically during COVID. I was hoping that Brexit may have resulted in a UK government that put the liberty of its citizens first. However, that simply has not happened. Part of the problem, of course, is that Westminster is largely opposed to Brexit. And none of the governments that we've had since 2016 have been fully committed to seeing it through. Consequently, consequently we've now got this most unsatisfactory halfway house with the country not really knowing where it is. One of the biggest problems, one of the biggest political problems that I think we have in the UK is the lack of opposition. Both Labour and Conservative parties are fighting over which one can be the same party first. Effectively, what we're looking at are two cheeks of the same backside, whose only real ambition is to hold on to power irrespective of any principles. However, my greatest worry with Westminster is the influence that the big corporations have over its members. I think the main political parties, many MPs as well as government ministers, are compromised by corporate lobbying, and for as long as this is tolerated, the political class will never really represent the people of this country. We currently have a Prime Minister who nobody voted for, who's just appointed a former Prime Minister who's not even an MP as the country's new Foreign Secretary. I used to be a staunch unionist. I was disturbed by how divided Scotland became as a result of the referendum on Scottish independence back in 2014. I never thought I'd say this, but the more disillusioned I have become with the UK government, the more I've started to wonder if Scottish independence might not be such a bad idea. In fact, had the Scottish government refused to keep locking down the country, and had they been more hesitant about the vaccine rollout, I would have perhaps embraced Scottish independence back then. But they didn't. In fact, they did the opposite. The Scottish government seemed to take everything that Westminster did and just add an additional margin to it. That isn't leadership, that is abuse of authority. Regardless of your views on the COVID vaccines, they should never have been given to young people who are not at risk or serious risk from COVID. I still remember our health secretary, Hamza Youssef, now our first minister, effectively telling Kay Adams on BBC Radio Scotland back in August 2021 that he would use vaccine passports to coerce young Scots into getting COVID vaccines. As far as I am concerned, that was a shocking abuse of power that should have disqualified him from ever holding public office again. As for the others, well, it's impossible to hold them to account because some of them have deleted their WhatsApp messages. So I'm afraid that I am quite disillusioned with both the UK government and the Scottish government right now. But despite everything I've said, I am still reasonably optimistic. But there is an awful lot of work to be done for this country to get itself sorted out and find its rightful place in the world. I think what we're crying out for right now, both here in Scotland and down south in England, is good, strong leadership. The question is, where will it come from? Certainly not from Rishi Sunak or David Cameron, and neither will it come from Keir Starmer. Frankly, I think the UK has to fall further before we see things change for the better. 
It looks like the Tories will suffer a terrible defeat in the next general election. Not because Labour are any good, rather because the Conservatives are so bad. Neither party has any vision, and I don't think either party can achieve anything worthwhile. What I think might happen is that a period in opposition might just give the Tories time to reflect and an opportunity to reinvent themselves. Unfortunately, the British people will end up paying a very heavy price for this. Perhaps it's a price worth paying. There is a chance that Scotland could fare a little better. Firstly, because I think the SNP are imploding. And secondly, because whichever party replaces them will have to address the question of independence from a different perspective. And thirdly, I think there's a real chance, unlike in England, for a new mainstream party which could potentially be very good for Scottish politics. So I'd like to finish with a quote by Lenin when he said, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. One thing is for sure, we are living in exciting times, if not disconcerting times. But I think we should remind ourselves that with change always comes new opportunities as well as threats. Thank you. Thanks for your monologue. Um, the one thing I would disagree with you on is that I don't think there ever was a pandemic, and I think the governments knew from the very start that it was all being set up, and uh, I, 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 they're all part of the same cabal, really. Uh, as far as voting for another party goes, I think we're way beyond that. Because I don't think they have any power whatsoever. No party has any power whatsoever. I actually get the feeling that they're, that no party actually wants to win the election. They're almost like, they're, they're so bad that it's almost like they're thinking if we do this bad enough, you know, we'll lose votes and what the other guys will have to pick up the shit that we've left behind. Uh, you know, and it's, this goes back to Theresa May. Um, she, she, she had policies that were clearly going to upset uh, her own voters, like the, 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 the hard Tory voters who uh, she, she threatened to, she was going to cancel the triple lock and, um, you know, she was going to cancel the, the fox hunting law and, and she just must have known that people are going to say, well, that turns me off from voting for them. And I think they got the shock of their life when they still won, or they, they nearly won. I think they were, you know. Um, I, I just don't think party politics is the, way, is, is the way forward. Because as soon as you say party, that means that they're all in it. You know, they're, they're, they're going to... They're, I mean, you take SNP, and none of them are allowed to... Even, they're, not, they're not allowed to voice their own opinion. They have to go by the party line. And the party line is dictated to the party. That's not the party sure. that's making up its rules. I, I get that. And I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily disagree with everything you've said. That, that, that's a, a statement. Have, have you got a question? Uh, well, you know, my, my question is, you know, if, if, is there not another way around the party system? Because... I think they're trying to go for the. Obviously, they're trying to go for this one world government, and they don't give a shit how bad the, the the our governments that we vote for are. But you know, if we don't go for the one world government, how on earth do we govern ourselves? Is there a way for us to govern ourselves that without? Okay. Uh, um, you know, without these party politics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I I get where you're coming from, and I have a lot of sympathy with how you're feeling about that, uh, and it's not easy. Um, there has been, uh, I, I've heard quite a few uh, discussions, quite large discussions actually on some of the Twitter spaces with some fairly big people uh, trying to push the idea of direct democracy. Um, now, I, I actually have some concerns with that um, because I think that can lead to not necessarily good things. Um, but I think like you've just said, I think things are so bad, not just in this country, but let's just focus on this country. I think things are so bad that it really does need to have a rethink of what, uh, how, how we actually operate politically. The, one of the points I touched on uh, was corporate lobbying. I think that is 
fundamentally the biggest problem that we have in, apart from people being dishonest, of course, but that's quite difficult to, uh, to control. But corporate lobbying, to me, the, the, the issue for me is that there's a, there's a, we've got all these guys sitting down in Westminster and, and Hollywood for that matter as well, who are not actually representing the people who voted for them. They, they, are, they are actually even playing, when, when you hear them speak and what they're saying, they're not playing to us as their audience. They're, they're playing to all sorts of different factions. I think you've got to be very careful about, um, I, I, I've got a lot, of, a lot of friends who I didn't have three years ago, and some of them have some fairly wacky ideas. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just very cagey about going down any particular route um, because you have to believe in something. And it's a very dangerous place when you stop believing in anything, you, you end up with nothing to hold on to at all. I, I do think this, the, the political system in this country is fixable. Um, I, think it's gone, I think it's gone pretty far, um, and it's going to take an awful lot to, uh, to make it better. Uh, I think the other thing you've got to do is, is forget about perfection. Forget about utopia. It, you're never going to get that. Uh, what you're looking for really is a shift, a shift from where we are today back into a, a better direction. Uh, you're never going to get, I think, everything that everybody here probably wants. But we, need, we need a system that is so, the system right now is so corrupt. Everything, every single thing is corrupt. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to disillusion you completely, but I, I do think it's, it's always been corrupt. Um, I, 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 I think the, the problem is, is, is the degree of corruptness. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need to just, we need to pull it back uh, if we can. And... Um, just to come in on that point, because I share a lot of the same views that the system is totally broken. And when you look at people who are looking at systems, um, <clears throat> people like Peter Senge, um, some of these world leaders in systems, there's a lady who's an American Scottish Jew who's been over here quite a lot, and I did some facilitation for her, called Janet Wheatley. And one of the things that a lot of people who think in systems say is that you need to build a new system with outside the old system because it is so broken. All we're doing is propping it up or hospicing it. And I've just been reading Rory Stewart's book and I have to read it in bite-sized pieces. And I keep meaning to take my blood pressure before I start it and after because what's happening in Westminster and the behaviour is just unacceptable. So for me, I think you can't mend a broken system. If you look at anybody who looks in systems, or whether it's a car or something, you can only mend it once or twice, but if it's a living system, what happens? And we are working with a living system, and that needs to change. You know, it needs to evolve and change, and the old anything that's living has to die and something new has to be born. And I'm a great believer that this system is dying and we can't change it. Um, I think there's, I know some people with some very wacky ideas, and I think I know somebody that you might be interested with a very wacky idea on energy. So I think we need to build a new system out with the old. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Sam? Um, again, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with, uh, with what, what you've said, and I don't disagree with... The, where you're coming from on that. Um, all I would say is that you have to be careful what you wish for in life. Um, that's all I, I would just urge caution there. There's an awful lot of people who, uh, particularly on, I mean, I spend probably too much time on Twitter, and uh, Richard and I were talking about it. I mean, Twitter is not real life. There is, there's a lot more to society and to life than, than Twitter. Um, but there, there, there's an awful lot of people who seem to, to and, and it, it, is, it is out of frustration, but when you start talking about almost revolution, um, as I said, you have to be very... Revolution and evolution are totally... Oh yeah, no, I, I, I accept that, I accept that. And look, I, I think, what, what I would say to you is that what we need and what we're short of at the moment are solutions. There's an awful lot of people who are criticizing what's going on, criticizing the government, criticizing the political system, criticizing the media, and, and very often quite rightly so. But you also have to come up with solutions. There, there, there has to be a balance between criticism and offering 
something positive. Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't. I mean, this is this is a, a monumental task. Anyone who wants to to bring about positive change, rather than simply complain about the, the, the state of the country at the moment, it's it is a monumental task. I do think that what will perhaps bring us to a crunch is going to be money. Uh, because, quite frankly, most Western governments are broke. Uh, the USA, for example, I, I think I googled it last night. The, the US, US debt is, I think, its state is $30 trillion. Thank you. Um, now, I, I have it on good authority um, that that figure is way, way, way higher. Um, the guy I'm talking about is a very, very smart senior hedge fund manager who wrote a book called Planet Ponzi. Um, you might have heard of him, Mitch Frierson. Uh, and, and I'm not saying he's right, but he's estimated that... Uh, the debt is probably closer to 200 trillion. You're, you're never, that, that country is never ever going to pay that debt off. It's, it's impossible. And I, I, the worrying thing for me is that's where the big drive at the moment towards digital currency is coming from. Uh, basically to set. Could it be all about money too? <laughs> well, <laughs> effectively they owe it to themselves. What, 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 what they're doing and, and what, what Rishi Sunak did as chancellor when he was when he was spending all this money, uh, is writing checks for your kids and your grandkids and their kids to pay. That, that's... Really exist. The money sorry? Really. The money well, no money exists. I mean, it, it's just a promise. It's just a promise to pay somebody. So uh, it's a check. It, it's a check. And I, I suppose you get to a point, if you have no money in your account, but you carry on writing checks, um, that's effectively what a lot of the governments are doing. Uh, but the difference is you've got a country with an economy with people working in it, and you're basically saying they'll pay it eventually, uh, whether it's 100 years. I mean, we only stopped paying off the debt of the Second World War uh, a few years ago. Uh, you mentioned that you think that uh, corporate lobbying is the biggest problem that we have, or one of the biggest problems that we have. And following on from the lady's point, um, people who have solutions being cut off at the knees, because um, I think it's understandable if you've got a good situation going, i.e. corporate lobbying, uh, you're not going to want that to end because there's going to be a lot of benefits that you're reaping from from uh, from doing so. Um, as a businessman, do you have any insight, uh, in speaking of positive visions, um, do you have any insight into what steps we could take to resolve the problem of cor corporate lobbying? Well, like you said, the, the, the problem is that uh, it's like weaning uh, a child off um, sweeties or um, weaning somebody off alcohol. The, 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 the guys down in Westminster have got very used to this uh, constant flow of money that comes in. I mean, I was looking at figures from in the banking world in particular. I mean, the money that they throw at, at, uh, at uh, ministers is just, it, it's, it's uh, how, how it's actually allowed to me and how it's allowed to get to where it's got to. And of course, they do have, and I can't remember the, the name of the, uh, the group, but there is a sort of internal policing body. But of course, it's policed by themselves. So how is that going to work? It's, it, it is a big challenge. I, I think uh, I alluded to this uh, earlier. Um, I am not looking forward. I mean, I, I have not enjoyed this government. When I say it's this government, because it's had various faces. Uh, but I have not enjoyed the Conservatives being in power. But I am even less looking forward to what is going to come next. Um, because actually the Tory party isn't conservative anymore and the Labour party isn't Labour either. We're really just, as I said, it's, it's, it's two cheeks of the same backside um, with different personalities. Um, I do think that uh, the conservatives might have a chance to reflect and to uh, think, uh, to reinvent themselves and maybe to become what they were before. That's not necessarily, that, I don't think that's actually the answer, but, but I think what I was talking about earlier is, is the, the shift that we're looking for. Uh, but you've got to start somewhere. To go back to this idea of how do you end corporate lobbying, um, I think you've got to lobby for that. 
Um, it, and it's, it's a long process, and I think you've got to have enough determined people. It probably comes back to what I was saying as well about Scotland, because unfortunately it's very, very difficult in England at the moment to see any opportunity of having a new party come into the system and actually get a foothold into, into UK politics. Uh, not impossible, but it, it's, it's really difficult. And, and the thing that they need more than anything is money. Um, Scotland is different. I, I do see that there is an opportunity, and there are a couple of organizations I'm aware of who are starting to, 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 to grow. Um, but Scotland could actually be the place where you do see a, a, some, some, some hope. Um, and I think that's probably because the SNP have burnt out. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how on earth do we um, investigate and prosecute the criminality? So whether it's lobbying or whether it's malfeasance in public office, whether it's not working for your people but being ran by handlers, whether they are corporate or they are further than that, um, we are facing so much criminality, maybe even as far as treason, and there is no accountability. There is nobody uh, in local government, even in community councils or, or national government, who is being taken to task for what they have done, and they're all supposed to be rigorously fighting with each other, and yet, bizarrely, they all do the same thing. Mm. What's that all about? So there has been so much criminality. I think surely a solution for a change is that there has to be prosecution and arrest right across the board for all the criminality that we all know so well. The police are not interested. They're not interested. They've been approached exhaustively and they won't even look. So how on earth can you rescue a political system where there is no prosecution there's no criminality. Any of us can be prosecuted for so little, so harshly, so quickly. From a speeding fine, you name it. Everything in that leadership or political realm is above the law completely. And above that is just way beyond. So if we want something new, the first thing I would say, and this is my question to you, is it not the first thing that we need is an arrest and a prosecution and a punishment and a deterrent for all those who enter public office with an oath of office so that they're held to task. And then lobbying becomes a slightly dangerous thing to do because you will be prosecuted. So you get a good wage, do a good job for a term of office, and then hand on to the next incumbent and be very proud of your job. But surely the starting point is prosecutions, arrests, quick trials, and then new people because everybody who's there and their handlers, they haven't even been looked at. Mm. So is the first thing that we're needing, if we want a solution, is actually investigations and prosecutions. Yeah, good question. Um, I would say that's maybe the second thing, because and I, I, I completely agree with what you just said, but if anyone was to try and actually make that happen just now, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a independent MP, uh, personally, I think you're going to fail. Um, there has to be an opposition, and this is this is really the whole, the, the very foundation of democracy is built on having a strong opposition. You would have thought that we have in the UK government anyway. You've got you, well in, in in Parliament, you've got. You've got the Conservative Party and you've got the Labour Party, essentially the, 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 uh, the two big parties in Westminster. But they are no longer uh, against each other. They, they are, uh, as I've already... I, I suspect, I actually think that we've had a Labour government since Tony Blair. I, I, I don't think we've actually seen a proper Tory party since, since Blair. We need to have an opposition. There needs to be a, a strong opposition that's going to... To, to challenge the system, challenge the people in that system, and like you said, you know, make sure there's consequences for them. But I, I think I think we're quite far off that yet. Thanks, Simon. That was great. Um, I'll try and make this. There's a lot of things that you said that um, raised ideas in my head. I'll try and make my questions as concise as possible. Um, 
I'm maybe different in the fact that I was always an independent supporter um, and I believed there was a true sense of optimism in 2014. I didn't feel like the nation was divided. Yes, there were people that wanted to vote no, but I felt that the country was brought together in many ways. There were so many people from different aspects of society that were united. Um, since 2014, all those different disparate groups have been divided on so many different topics. I, I don't even need to state them all. Everyone huh. knows what they are. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So my uh, uh, interest, although I'll, I'll, I'll always be an independent, I always believe that a country should govern itself, my interest in independence is waning because I think if we got it, then what good would it do? Because the SNP currently, the way that Nicola Sturgeon took the party, it just became a globalist cause following globalist causes. Yeah. Um, there's no radicalism there to make any difference. So I suppose the first question is, you know, um, how do you think that Scottish independence could make a difference now? Um, and second question is um, going into the Brexit sort of situation. I voted Remain, but since then I've seen the way that um, the European Union has gone and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, her von der Leyen, and her uh, support for various American wars that are currently ongoing um, sickens me to the teeth. And I'm actually glad that we're out of that now. Um, economically, I can see a benefit, obviously, because there is the, the free trade and the freedom of movement. But there's a solution to that. There's uh, the European Free Trade or Association, EFTA, which, so I'm told, you can join within three months. Um, but there's no political will there to do that. So, yes, I'd like to be economically involved in the European area, but politically, no way. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. I just wonder what your thoughts were on EFTA. Well, I was, as I said, I was in two thousand fourteen. I was a very different person politically. I was, uh, I, I was, as I said, a staunch unionist. Um, from what's happened over the last, uh, particularly over the last three and a half years, um, my views. Have changed. I wouldn't say that I'm. I, I'm, I'm certainly no fan of the SNP. Certainly not with uh, the people who are running the show at the moment. Um, but my my views on all of that have, I would say, softened. Uh, and I've spoken to quite a lot of people and shared a lot of conversations about this. For me, one of the one of the problems with Scottish independence was primarily economic. Um, because I just simply didn't buy into a lot of the stats that the SNP in particular were pushing. And, but it's, it, I've got to a point now that I'm actually, as I said, it, it, during, during COVID, if the Scottish government had actually said what I thought it should say, um, I was ready to go, you know what, I, I'll, I'm gonna ditch Westminster. I think this is, I wanna just stay and I just want to stay in Scotland and, and focus my attention on Scotland. And you know what? Even if it makes me poorer, I would have been happy to do that. And I think that's, to me, I think there has to be a reality uh, in terms of independence. I also could not understand why, and I know different people have got different views on this, but I couldn't understand why people were so eager to break a union with England simply to make another one with Europe. Exactly. I, I couldn't get that. And in fact, to me, better the devil you know. Uh, I, I'm not saying the relationship with England is perfect. I think there's a lot of history that uh, is, uh, raises a lot of questions. But I think to, to simply pull out of the union with England and to rush into another union with a whole load of people that we have very little in common with, to me, just seemed ludicrous. If someone spoke to me about having real independence, as in saying, right, Scotland will be independent, we will not answer to England and we will not answer to Europe, that to me is a more exciting prospect. And actually, when people start saying, yes, but, you know, it's, we're scared about what might happen. Well, 
that's what comes with independence. Mm -hmm. You've got to be more confident in that. You've actually got to say, yes, there are risks, but we're willing to take those risks. We're confident in ourselves. We're confident in our nation and go for it. Um, that to me is, is where Scotland perhaps has a future as an independent country. Uh, but I think there's an awful lot of people who are simply not realistic in terms of what that actually means. And as usual, as, as what happened with Brexit, all the lies that were told, similarly with independence, there's an awful lot of people who simply don't understand anything about the consequences of independence. I mean, the big question, what about money? What about currency? Uh, Can I just interject there? Sure. With currency, I think that was always, you know, that was always a wishy-washy one because, I mean, it was always going to be the threat that was going to be used in the run-up to the referendum. But on day one of uh, independence, you know, London is going to negotiate immediately with Scotland. On, sure, uh, but... For, because the various power plays... Okay, okay, but do, do you want your money supply to be in the hands of the Bank of England? If you're independent... Do you want your money supplied with the Bank of England? I would say no. I mean, pers personally, I think that there would be a transition period. I think that all the sort of chatter around currency would fade away on day one of independence because there would be a, there may be a transition where you were aligning yourself with the Bank of England, but there would be a transition into something else. Um, to me, that 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 is a problem, uh, and I'm not saying it's insurmountable. For me, I again, I would use the same argument as I used for Europe, um, and I would say. You know, be brave. Look at your own currency. Look at what you're worth as, as Scotland. Go out to the, uh, the, the money markets and create your own currency. Yes, it will be tough. Yes, people's standard of living will probably drop. But that's the price you've got to pay. If you want independence, at least look at it for what it really is and grasp it. I mean, my feeling is, is that London has um, taken away so much wealth from the entire country. I've got no bone of contention with England or English people or Welsh people or, or anywhere in the United Kingdom. And what I do have a bone of contention with is that we've been asset stripped. The entire country has been asset stripped. And there's so much wealth that is sitting in land and uh, buildings. And it's it's not owned by anyone in the country. You know, it's, it's owned by foreign, par foreign uh, investors, you know, that have no interest in this how we succeed as a, as a country, you know, and it's, um, there's so much intricacies to the... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not straightforward and it's not something that we can yeah. resolve in, in a question yeah. tonight. But, but, but what I would say, again, I mean, I, I stand by what I said earlier, but I think that, you, you know, whether there's been injustice, and I'm sure there, there has been injustices in the past, um, I don't think you can go back because if you start doing that, then how far back do you go? I mean, do we start looking at claiming against the Romans uh, or do we go back <laughs> e even further? No, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm being serious. It's, it's, you, you have to say, I mean, it's a bit like, I mean, I, I had a, a, a discussion, an argument about somebody about Israel the other day. Um, and th there's a lot of arguments that Israel perhaps shouldn't be there because it's maybe somebody else's land. Um, but the point is, it is. It is there. Um, you can't go and undo... The, the people who have been born into Israel, who, have, who are now Israeli, who have always now... That, that's, that's all they know. Um, the, the, most countries, if you go back in history, have they're, they're been <clears throat> formed or built or shaped by injustice. Uh, to try and uh, go back in history and unravel all of that and, and try and make it all right is impossible. Good, too, but... We're not going that far back, though, when it comes to to. <laughs> and with Scottish oil, you know, you know, I mean, you know, Thatcher basically destroyed industry in Scotland. So Scot, you know, Scotland gaining oil yeah. actually made Scotland poorer. You know, you go to Glasgow in the in the eighties after the discovery of oil. It's that yeah. absolute. Wasteland. Well, this is a part I couldn't understand about the SNP anyway, because uh, the last election obviously they had to rely on the Greens and they closed down uh, large parts of North Sea oil. And uh, to me, that is still a, a huge asset that needs to be exploited. Uh, but that uh, not everybody will agree with that. But uh, that's my opinion. Simon, you, <clears throat> you said something that was very um, encouraging for me, um, which is that you thought that there was a particular opportunity in Scotland yeah. for uh, a new political party. 
Um, so I've got, I've got two questions and then followed by an idea. Um, so the, the, the first question is, is f for this new political party to emerge, would you agree that it can't be made up of the same individuals who've been involved in the co or who are involved in the current parties? Yeah. Um, so, firstly, do you agree with that? And then, secondly, so can I answer that question? Yeah, okay. It's very easy. It's, yeah. just, it's yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my second. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> so my, my second question is that if, um, you know, if a new political party emerged in Scotland, um, and given the fact that it would need new people to be involved, would you consider, consider um, standing for that party um, <laughs> as a candidate? <laughs> It's quite flattering. Um, <laughs> uh, again, I'll answer it very directly, yes. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so now, now my idea, right? Um, and... Um, it, it's just a little bit coincidental um, because I didn't realise we were going to be talking so much about politics today. Um, so it's only since we left the last venue. We, we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so um, um, because it's myself that's collecting the signatures for the um, uh, petitions for each of Edinburgh's five MPs, um, and um, so I printed only a hundred copies of a leaflet um, this afternoon um, and I was just going to give it to people who on their way out who are signing the petition right so I just went over to get one um, and my idea is to launch a new political party um, and you're welcome to stand as a candidate <laughs> um, but I've, I've come up with a, a different way of, of how to run the party, um, and the main problem um, with the political system is is the structure of it. You know, it's a little you know you know like you said that that basically there's barely any difference between Labour and the Conservatives, and um, um, and the fundamental flaw in the current political system. Um, that I've identified, right, um, you know, um, I might be wrong, obviously, but what I've identified is the, f the most fundamental flaw is that in the same way that a dentist would always choose to become a career dentist, politicians, um, you can't fault them for choosing to become career politicians. And that's where the flaw starts, because they then have to toe the party line, yep. um, and they have to then have greater allegiance to their party than they do to their yeah, I think the gentleman here touched on that point yeah. earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so my idea um, is, is to create a political party that is just to stand for elections in one city, right? Um, so, um, I had, so the idea is, is that each city would have its own political party. Um, and the name that I've come up with, right, is um, Edinburgh People. Okay, um, vote Edinburgh people. The slogan that I've come up with is, is don't elect politicians again, elect people, you know? Um, and um, so, as I've put on here, Edinburgh people, the new party by the people of Edinburgh, for the people of Edinburgh, don't trust politicians, trust people. Um, a revolution in politics is about to take place. Be part of it, right? <laughs> Um, and um, so you can all gr grab one of these leaflets on the way out. Um, but, but the idea is, is that, um, is that you, well, my, my strategy is to try and get a thousand members in one of Edinburgh's constituencies, like, for example, Edinburgh North or Edinburgh yeah, South. Yeah. Um, 
and to, um, and to see if it's possible to, to build a party that's designed to represent the, the people um, and who, who, that can campaign in a very intense way and have a lot of commitment to that party because they know that it's, it's designed to represent them in their city. Yep. What do you think about the idea? I think it's a great idea. I, th I, think, I think the more people that do what you've just described, uh, the better and, and actually gives me hope. I'm sure it gives everyone hope. Uh, everyone needs to get politically active. Part, part of the problem, this, this apathy that we have in this country, and I can understand absolutely why it's come about, but you know what, as I said earlier, it, it's all very well to complain. You, you need to actually do something. Uh, and, and I'm a great one, believe, I'm a great believer in, in actually doing stuff. It's all very well talking, it's all very well complaining, but someone's actually got to go out and do something. You've got to go and knock on doors. You've got to go and speak to people. You've got to go and, I mean, if you're, if you're unhappy with your MP, go and speak to them. Don't, don't, just, don't just bang off an email. Go and actually knock on their door and sit down and say, look, this isn't right. Uh, the more people who get active, just as you've described there, I think absolutely, I think we all need to do that, all of us. We all have a responsibility. I think that's another problem that we've got in this country is that we, we've gone from being quite responsible people to be people who want the government to be responsible for us. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to stop that. Yeah. We've got to take responsibility for ourselves, for our kids, for, our, for, for the way that we want our lives to, to, to be. Yeah. We've got to do that. And I, I commend you for that. I, I think that's absolutely what we need. So just, just one other point on, on because I, you touched on something else there. I, I, I think career politicians, uh, that is a problem. It, it's, it's a problem throughout the, the UK. It's not just in Westminster, it's in, it's in Holyrood as well. Um, I, I think that that's a very worrying trend that you've got people who go almost from university into, into Parliament. Uh, it's impossible for anyone to, 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 to have no life experience and, and to be in charge of um, people's, event, people's futures. Uh, it, it's just wrong. It, it's, it's absolutely wrong. But I think what we also have to do is we need to raise the bar for entry into uh, whether it's Westminster or Holyrood. Uh, the quality of people that are going into politics. I, I think it was Billy Connolly who said that, that the mere desire to be a politician should ban you for life. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you need to have people who are actually reluctant, who don't really want to be politicians. They're probably the ideal candidate. Uh, <laughs> but but it, is, it is a problem. I mean, we're, and, and the other thing is that, and I, I, had a, I had a discussion with an MP uh, a few months ago about this, is that if you look at what MPs are paid, it's actually quite difficult to live off an MP's salary and live in the centre of London. Uh, well, hang on. I was I'm not. <laughs> the expenses is, 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 is another is another matter. But the, the, you're not going to attract. People say, well, what about you know when, when you look back and they they mention great names that we heard about in the 1960s and the, you know the thing is that it's not like those people don't exist anymore. They're just not in Westminster, and to attract people like that, one you've got to pay them properly, and secondly you've also got to change the whole the whole um, being of, of, of an MP. If you look at the way that the, the British press is in particular, and the Americans are maybe worse, but if you become a, a public figure in this country, life is pretty awful for most of them. Now, there are some narcissistic types who get turned on by that. And, and I mean, there's Mr. Hancock, for example. You know, you've got people who are drawn into that and, and they definitely should be kept far, far away from any, um, any, any political activity at all. Um, but you, we do have to raise the bar. We need to get better people into politics. And uh, the, the danger, because the, the conversation I was having was, was should you pay MPs more? And part of me thinks, yes, you should. Not right now, because all you'd end up doing is simply giving more money to the useless people that we have currently representing us. Hello, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this liberal dem democratic or liberal governance, this governance under a liberal democracy, will it get us out of this social economic quagmire? 
Jeez. Why is that pushing it? Had to be my father that asked that question. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a difficult one. Um, it's, sorry, it seems that a liberal democracy works fine when the economy of a country is strong and everything's going well. When that starts to fail, as it seems to be failing now, will it get us through? Yeah, okay, um, thanks. Um, <laughs> Winston Churchill said a couple of things that were quite interesting in relation to that. One, and I can't remember exactly verbatim what it was, but it was something to the effect of um, a, a five-minute conversation with the average voter is enough to put you off uh, democracy for life. Um, but the other one, uh, which I remember more clearly, was um, democracy is the worst form of government, apart from all the others. Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's, I, I spend a lot of time in the Middle East and uh, I've seen Dubai grow. I first went into, stepped into Dubai in 1997 and it was, it was a thriving place then, but it, it, was, it was a shadow of what it is now. It, it's, it's grown into an incredible city. Um, now, a lot, a lot of people uh, forget when they're traveling there, when you board an Emirates plane in Glasgow and you fly off to Dubai, the first thing they forget is actually that they're sandwiched in, in or right in the middle of a war zone. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on around you. Um, but the other thing people forget as well is that it, it's not a democracy. Uh, it might feel like it does in the UK when you walk around the mall and you're sitting by the pool, but it's not. Um, and it, yeah. People have said to me, a benevolent dictator must be a fantastic uh, political um, system. And I can't argue with that. But the problem is that <laughs> how long does it stay benevolent? And if it changes, what can you do about it? And um, the answer is probably not a lot. Uh, so that's, that's a really difficult question, but thank you very much for asking it. <laughs> you answered it very well, because power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It does, So yeah. it probably wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good idea. Hi, thanks for your talk, uh, Simon. Um, you, in the talk, you were quite critical uh, of our government, and rightly so, I think. There's been quite a bit of criticism about politicians tonight. Um, but in the context of the COVID pandemic and the net zero particularly, I wonder uh, what your view is about the responsibility of the advisors, the scientific and medical advisors to governments and how they performed. And uh, and also, the. so I'm thinking of um, Chris Whitty, Patrick yeah, Allen, yeah. Jason Leach, Gregor Smith. Has anyone heard of Gregor Smith? Anyone know who he is? You're talking about the guy that's being exposed down in Westminster? No, no, he's the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland. Okay, sorry, no, I, I, I'm, no. But he's had a very low profile. Yep. I'm also thinking of SAGE, uh, the JCVI and the MHRA, because yeah. it's the JCVI and MHRA who gave, firstly approved the vaccines and then gave advice about who should have the vaccine. It wasn't Boris Johnson or Matt Hancock, yeah. it was them. And then... So, as well as the the uh, scientific medical advisors, what do you think about the role of the mass media and and social media? Because it seems to me that they've been instrumental in censoring alternative medical and scientific views. Yep. So it's you know, we can it's very easy to criticise politicians, but there are other very significant players around who we need to. Um, I suppose, hold to account if we can, and certainly take account of their, of their role in all of this. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Um, and um, in fact, there, there was actually something, as I set off from Dundee this evening, there was something on the radio. I was, for some bizarre reason, I was listening to Radio 4. Um, but it was actually on that very topic, which is quite uh, coincidental. Um, I, I think... I, I draw a parallel to what I was talking about earlier in terms of corporate lobbying. There's way too much money, um, corporate money in politics. There's also way too much corporate money in science as well. 
And um, it's not just, you're quite right, it's not just the politics that's being corrupted, it's, it's the whole industry that's corrupt. Um, so absolutely, yeah, the, the, these, these guys need to be held to account. And going back to social media, um, Twitter has changed quite a bit since Elon Musk has uh, taken over, but he's still very much restricted by particularly uh, the EU. Um, Facebook behaved atrociously during the, uh, the whole COVID uh, thing. It, it was absolutely disgusting the way that they employed so-called fact checkers that didn't know anything that they were talking about. Um, all this needs to be exposed. Um, and, and that comes back to this gentleman's question as well about the you need to hold people to account this I, I love it when politicians come on and say I, I take full responsibility for that what the hell does that mean is it just words and then he moves on to the next topic there has to be accountability with responsibility these people have to be held to account uh, I, I think you've raised a, a really interesting point there but I would I would say when it came to uh, the government's handling of it, Boris Johnson, who was the greatest prime minister that never was in many ways, um, actually almost made a fantastic decision, but didn't. He bottled it. Um, and in fact, he bottled it with most things because his head's just, well, <laughs> it's Boris Johnson. But uh, yes, he took advice, but ultimately he is the chief executive of the country. Now, he could have asked for other advice, but he was actually very close to making a very, a very good decision, and he, he didn't. Um, so I, ultimately, I still hold him responsible. But I, th I think what you've said is absolutely right. There's a whole, it's not just one person, it's not just one body, it's, it's, it's a, it's, and it's not just government, it's industry as well. If you look at how corrupt companies like, for example, Pfizer are, in fact, most most of these big corporations are hugely corrupt. Um, and we've gone, from, we've gone from capitalism now to corporatism, and, and they are different. Um, capitalism is supposed to benefit the, the little man, the, the guy that wants to go and set up a company and do whatever he does to, to work hard to do well for his family, etc. That's gone in many, in many cases. It's, it's all been taken over by huge corporations. And, we used to have something called the Monopolies and Mergers Commission. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. There, there is a, a similar thing, but again, it's been watered down. Uh, but effectively, we are looking at a collection of monopolies that are now running the world. You were saying about Boris Johnson. He was about to make a good decision and yeah, then I, bottled it. He did, yeah. Boris Johnson didn't think we should lock down. And I think he should have stuck with his gut feeling. My whole career was in healthcare, starting as a nurse, working both um, in the corporate land in pharma and in charities. I had three employment tribunals in pharma because I asked questions I wasn't meant to, so I was conveniently made redundant. So one of the things, just to point out, the MHRA is 80% funded by pharma, so you have a problem there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but on reading Rory Stewart's book, very interesting how Cameron didn't want him as a stand as an MP because he hadn't come up through the ranks. The new, in, in the book it says that Cameron or political parties want people straight from university to come up through the ranks so they'll do the leaf leafleting, the hard knocking indoors, and Rory Stewart wasn't wanted. But my question is, um, do you think MPs should have psych evaluations before they? Do you think MPs should have psych evaluations before they stand? So, so, sorry, what 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 evaluation? Psychiatric. Oh, evaluation. oh God! <laughs> That's the old nurse coming out. You need to I, I would psychiatric. I would actually go. Thanks for your question. I, I would go one step further. I, I think they should all be drug tested as well. Actually. So. Sorry for a second question, but to get better people into politics, I think the extra wage is a good idea if that's all that they're allowed to do, and that's deterred. Isn't party politics part of the problem where people do not want to be locked in? 
to a party. They could be the head of a particular task and they're brilliant at that task. There are people in different parties who are obliged and have to fight with each other if they could only work together, but they're not allowed. So there's good people in various parties trapped in those mm. parties. And I think a lot of good people would not want to go into politics and be trapped in a party. They want to serve their community or their country mm. only, first and foremost, but they're not allowed. Because if you're in a party, as was said earlier, and I agree with a lot of what Mark was saying, which is brilliant, is we need the fresh air of people who are free paid better, rewarded for their sacrifice mm. of time away from business. But is party politics not the perennial permanent problem where you need people to step forward for a task, be judged in that task for four years, mm. and then somebody else is elected to that task. And you can have people from all sorts of different communities literally working together, people who are the best at that mm. job, nothing to do with parties. Yeah, what you're, what you're really describing is a collection of independents. And that is, that is one possibility. But I, I think you're right. I think the party is fundamentally flawed. But it's a bit one of these, it's a bit like what I was saying about the Churchill quote about democracy. It, it's, it's what's a workable alternative. Um, but if you can come up with one, there's an opening, there's an interview, there's a whole lot of candidates, and it's selected by a vote. Mm. One task at a time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'm, not, I'm not dismissing that. I, I, think, uh, I think what we... What we it goes, goes back to what I was saying earlier. We need ordinary people to get involved in politics. Because if you're not happy with something, do something about it. That's what it comes down to. My question is related to that, but a wee bit different, I suppose. If we are not happy with how things are at the moment, and you mentioned earlier, problem, reaction, solution. So our problem is that we're so disgruntled with politics. Our reaction might be that we could create chaos in our country or civil war or, you know, stand up and fight against it. What about the solution that they could bring in a one world government? What would you think of that? Not that I want it, but do you Sorry, think... Sorry, I, I, I lost... Well, do you think that the govern our country or the government mm. or the elite could possibly bring in a one-world government to solve the problem if we are all so disgruntled with the way our parliament and our governments are going at the okay. moment? Um, yeah, it, it's... <laughs> what, I would, what I would... How I'd respond to that is that, firstly, I think that... Um, when you're saying one world government, I, I don't honestly believe that there's enough cooperation throughout the world to have one world government. You might end up with two or three. Uh, that's probably more likely. Um, th there's an awful lot going on at a level, at a sort of beyond corporate level, which is really difficult to work out at the moment. It's always difficult to work out, but right now, because there's so much change going on, it's so difficult. Um, and in terms of how you stop that from happening, in, in terms of sort of uh, elite takeover or corporate takeover, whatever you want to describe it, um, I think I think the answer to that is is just what we've been saying, and that is that everyone has to get involved, and also. You see, what, what, where these people are so strong, and when I say they, uh, they are just like us. It's just that they have massive bank accounts. Um, but where they are so strong is that they, they, particularly from a corporate side, is that corporations are very disciplined. They have, they're not a democracy. Corporations are, are um, very um, clearly and, and cleverly controlled organizations. And that is how they are actually making such progress, because they're not a bunch of people who have all sorts of different opinions and fall out over everything. Um, it's the old saying, united we stand, divided we fall. Um, it's so easy. This is the whole point of what I was talking about, division, division, division. It's so easy to divide people. I mentioned about how I think that this latest war 
uh, in the Middle East has divided people because what you do is you, you tap into people's emotions. And as soon as you've got there, you've won. And people don't seem to understand that. They, they seem to think that by getting emotional and shouting and screaming is somehow going to win. Everyone else, the, the, the guys who are controlling it is looking at you laughing. Um, it, it's, how, it's how you need leadership. That's what I was going on about. You need strong leadership. And really what you need to do is beat them at their own game. Can I ask another question? The second thing, leading on from that a wee bit, is what do you think about all these um, migrants that have come into the country? Do you think they're going to cause a problem to divide and conquer? Because that's a fate. I think that that's quite a big worry for a lot of people when I speak to them about, you know, the differences, especially with this Israeli war now and the migrants that are in the country and the Muslims. Do you see that anything, there could be eruptions there in terms of them causing chaos or, you know, maybe being the solution? Yeah, it, it's, it's a, again, it's a, it's a good question. It's quite a difficult question, actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't believe, I mean, look, the first, the first duty of any government is to protect its citizens. That, that means to protect its borders. Our country is failing at that. And it has been for some time. This is not just something that's happened yesterday. This has been going on and on and on. And all we hear is, is these wonderful claims from Rishi Sunak that uh, it's his, you know, he, he will do it, whatever. What the hell does that mean? Um, we should not be allowing people just simply to walk in to our country. Um, of course, there's always going to be cases, genuine cases of people who are fleeing. And, and, and it's very difficult because you've got to somehow sort out the wheat from the chaff. I, 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 said, I spend a lot of time in the Middle East and uh, you've got to bear in mind that a lot of the countries where refugees have been coming from, particularly the, the big influx that came during the Syrian war. Um, there were countries all around, very close by, but no, they, they've, they've, these guys have trekked throughout Europe to come to the UK in many cases. Um, it's not like you're walking along the beach in Jumeirah in Dubai and you see a little dinghy turn up and uh, people coming out and you know, waving around that they're, you know, we're here. It doesn't happen. Um, why does it happen? Well, because they know what would happen to them if, 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 if they did. Now, I, I think, personally speaking, I, I think the Rwandan plan is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I still think that there's ways in which this could be dealt with. Uh, and I think there's also, there's, there's things, there's people orchestrating things, for example, from France. I'm not entirely convinced that they are actually helping us despite the fact that we're, we've given them a lot of money. Um, but yeah, that needs to be closed down. Absolutely. But whether or not, I, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily believe, and I'm not going to rule it out, but I don't, there's a lot of people saying, oh, this is part of a plan. I, I don't honestly think it is. That's my, my personal opinion. Uh, I don't think, I, I think it's just incredible incompetence on behalf of government. I mean, I, I would just say, I don't believe in this incompetence idea um it, it it you know i i i see it as just being proposed as you know every time there's malfeasance um you know it's 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 basically um excused as incompetence i mean our border you know we, we have the we, we have the easiest border to defend you know <laughs> of, of 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 almost any country <laughs> that i can think of um obviously being surrounded by sea and oceans um so so you know so so given that we know that we've got the easiest border to defend and and we're we're failing um in that then i i, I don't agree with with the idea that it's incompetence I, I i believe that it's uh it's being done on purpose uh for what reason that is something else um that is something else i think a lot of what we see um, in the media is just theatre, you know, it's not necessarily what's actually happening. Um, and also, the bigger question is, and this has been touched upon in previous talks, but, you know, 
what about the huge amounts of fighting age men that are being imported into the country legally, you know, and what are they there for? You know, that's the bigger question, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, changing the, the tack a little bit, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk how the pandemic had led you to reevaluate your understanding of politics. It, it, it seemed to me you were suggesting it kind of radically changed. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any other domains uh, of, of interest to you where the same thing is happened. I'm thinking either like the, your understanding of, of uh, history, your understanding of your uh, emotional self, your, under, your spiritual understanding, um, and any other area where you've, as a result of what happened in the pandemic and all the manipulations and lies, you've come to look at some area of interest to you and thought, there's another thing where I actually didn't understand that very well and you've, you've came to see it differently. Thanks. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, make, I'll, make it, I'll make it a bit hard, but yeah. I know that's yeah. a personal question. So no, look, I, I, it's just, I, 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 I'm I, asking it because I know a lot of people feel yeah. that's happened. Is, yeah, I, I, the pandemic, they're looking at other things and thinking, I wonder if the same thing has been applied historically to my understanding of for example, Second World War, or yeah. my own emotional development, or my relationship to my religion, or yeah. anything, yeah. My, my sense yeah. of myself. Yeah, it's, it's a fine question. Um, I, I, think, I think for me, uh, just personally speaking, um, when you have time on your hands, uh, for me, I've always worked, and I think I was getting to a point where you're almost like that, that treadmill experience where you're just running, 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 running. And it's very easy for, peop for people to say to you, oh, it's, you, you're the one that's in control here. You can stop and you can, but it's almost like an addiction. And then someone, as in the government, just came along and just pulled the plug out. Stop. That was the first time in my life that had ever happened. And... There were some positive, I mean, I, I, I think the whole thing was dreadful, but personally speaking, there were some positives out of that. I, uh, I spent a lot of time walking my dogs, uh, speaking to my family, uh, reflecting, a lot of in, in, introspection. Um, so to answer your question, yes, the, the, there has been a lot of um, personal change as, as a result of that. I, I go back to what I raised earlier, and that is that I think... The one thing that I, I would say has, has, has changed uh, for me is that I now question everything. I don't have a bias anymore. Uh, I, try and, I, I try very hard to let go of a lot of my old biases. Um, I, I just I try and keep an open mind uh, on everything. Uh, and it's quite unsettling because there is some comfort in, in being in a tribe, in, in holding on to things that you don't know, but you believe, if, if, if that makes sense. And I, I'm not sure if I actually believe anything anymore. Uh, and that's quite an unsettling place to be. Uh, <laughs> Can I? It's interesting you're saying, because that's, that's the opposite of, of most people. I think your development through life, you, you, you evolved, uh, as you go older, towards certainty. You think you understand things better, you know, because you've maybe invested a lot in it, your understanding of yeah. politics or history or culture or yourself. Yeah. You know, you've been 50, 60, whatever, 70 years in that journey, and you think, yeah, I kind of know this now. And then COVID comes along and it turns out you yeah. don't really know it as well as you thought. Good point. It's an interesting answer. All I know is that we know nothing. It's okay. I'm trying to keep going back. Yeah. It's, 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 not, it's not a comfortable place. So have you got a question? Yeah, just since we brought up, we've gone on to the COVID kind of subject and the whole, you know, the kind of epiphany thing. You've had a, oh, my God, this, something's not right. Um, just, just to lead into the whole pharmaceutical industry kind of thing. Can I just say I've been there for the past 30 years, literally. Um, I came across stuff that absolutely blew my mind and I would t absolutely recommend that people, he's dead now unfortunately, but people um, research Professor Hans Rusch 
who wrote a book that changed my life completely called Slaughter of the Innocent. Okay. And it's about the pharmaceutical industry and vivisection. And basically, he there's another book that he wrote after that, Naked Empress, and at the end he says, human experimentation is where we're going. And I've been there psychologically, emotionally for, for decades. I'm starting to get quite emotional now. <laughs> um, so I would recommend that people look into this and see exactly what's going on. I work in healthcare myself. Yeah. I'm a clinician. And uh, I feel like I've been in another sort of dimension um, along with some people, but the majority of people just go along blindly. And the pharmaceutical industry is slowly killing us. Um, I, I really feel really strongly about this. And I think people, if you, if you start to join the dots... If you look into um, Professor Hans Rusch and his, and his company, it was called Civitas in America, and start to realise how exactly they're getting away with poisoning us and poisoning the planet and poisoning our minds and our emotions, and that's it. Could, could, could I just come back? It's not really a question, but can I ask you a question? Um, do you feel that from a, as a result of COVID, Mm -hmm. Do you feel less lonely? <clears throat> Do you feel that more people are, are, are awake to what is perhaps going on in the pharmaceutical industry? In little pockets, yes. But because I, because I delve into occasional work with NHS until it drives me nuts, um, oh my God, the blind allegiance is just frightening. Yeah, yeah. And I've never had any vaccines, not one. I was determined to never have one. I have seen colleague after colleague after colleague drop ill. Yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And yeah. I have felt intimidated and um, it's been terrible. I've had to be very careful of what I, uh, you know, what, what I see. I'm in a better yeah. position now, a bit better financial position, but I was in a terrible position previously. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's... I think there's a lot of people that probably secretly agree with people that think, my God, there's something wrong with COVID, but they just don't know how to come out and say yeah, it. Yeah. And we have to help them. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think you've been a true politician. Uh, <laughs> and, I say uh, that. And, and <laughs> you, you've, you've stood up there and you've answered questions and they've been difficult questions. And you haven't shirked any of those questions. And uh, I really thank you for that. Uh, and I do hope that you do enter politics. Right so then. thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you.